There's a rumor out there saying that Nikola Motors is on the verge of going under. They missed their delivery target for 2022. They're burning through a lot of cash, forcing them to raise money through debt and stock options. And they have a lot of hurdles to overcome when it comes to manufacturing and gaining customers in 2023. But in this video, I want to give you guys a contrarian perspective to all the news that's come out over the past couple of months. I want to discuss the massive progress that's taken place in the incentive program for 2023, how companies are shifting their focus towards zero emissions, and how that will all end up benefiting businesses that are taking a very bold charge at developing a technology at a very early stage. So strap in folks, because we have a lot of data, a lot of charts, and a lot of news outlets to look at. But as usual, guys, before we get into it, make sure to drop me a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. So to start things off, let's see where my inspiration for this video came from. As you can see, I recently came across this article hitting on Nikola Motors and Hyzon, which is a fuel cell truck maker, about their struggles to survive. And to be honest, I am not surprised by this at all. These companies are startups at an early stage in a market that is still developing. There's not enough scale out there to really bring down the affordability of the products that these companies are making. That's where government incentives and commercial adoption really start to take place, which is exactly what Nikola and even Hyzon's goal actually is. And what exactly do I mean by that? Well, I mean pilot tests, raising awareness about the technology, and making sure there's an end-to-end -end solution for meeting customer needs. Just like with the consumer electric vehicle business, you need to make sure that customers don't need to completely change their operations by switching to an electric platform. And right now, it is actually extremely difficult for most companies to do that, which is exactly why global battery electric truck sales are still struggling. Now granted, when I say the word struggling, I mean that in a very lenient way. These companies are still selling their trucks to dealers at a record pace. It's just that the rate of adoption is not as fast as many people were hoping. And to those folks, I raised one simple question. What exactly do you expect to happen in a recessionary year in 2022, coming off the biggest inflationary move we have seen in 40 years? Because let's be honest, the adoption of electric vehicles is really a long-term game. But even if in the short term you want to criticize the rate at which technologies are being adopted, it's important to understand what the macroeconomics are actually telling us. Here's a chart that's showing us the sales of the S&P 500 companies over the past 10 to 20 years. In yellow, that's the number you want to pay attention to, whereas in white, we have the CPI inflation rate on a year-over-year -year basis. There's obviously a really clear trend. Unlike what we've seen over the past 40 years, CPI is actually at all-time highs and sales are declining at the same time. What exactly does that tell you? It tells you that the cost of manufacturing a product or even a service because of the high wages is going to be at a record cost. Meanwhile, sales or demand from consumers and fleet customers are going to be coming down throughout 2022. Because obviously people are forward looking and they see the recessionary forces at play with higher interest rates. So naturally, as the demand for consumer goods comes down, the demand for products and innovation in the fleet and trucking space is also going to fall. Meaning EV companies specifically that are engineering and delivering their products to market today are facing the toughest battle we have seen in the past 40 years. But even despite that, a company like Nikola is still executing on their production targets and they're taking the hit early on to make sure that trucks can get on the road to the right customers. The average gross margin of a truck that rolls off Nikola's Arizona Coolidge facility is negative 100%. I recently watched one of Bear's Workshop's flyover videos of the Nikola facility, which by the way are fantastic, and he estimated that Nikola is probably going to be delivering by the end of the 2022 year around 250 to 290 trucks based on the amount of trucks that are sitting in the parking lot and in inventory. That obviously is below the 300 to 500 goal that the company had set out. But let's be honest, there's more companies out there than just Nikola that have reduced their guidance for revenue, profits, and deliveries in 2022. 
But what really is instilling the confidence in me for the overall trucking space and the electrification race is fleets and logistics companies like PGT Trucking here actually adopting these trucks at an early stage, even if it had not been a part of their plan for the fiscal year. This company actually has an LOI to purchase around 100 fuel cell trucks from Nikola in 2023. But because of the insane demand for electrified solutions, the company actually purchased their first battery electric vehicle from Nikola through a dealer. This was obviously not planned by the company and because the cost of this vehicle is so high, especially without incentives, it's really interesting to see that they value reducing emissions, raising awareness more than taking a short term hit on their expenses. And so now if a company that is the leading flatbed provider in North America is setting a sustainability goal by 2025 to reduce their fleet emissions by 35%, what will happen with all the other hundreds of fleets and logistics companies in the country? Will they follow suit or will they just continue running their natural gas and diesel burners, which are actually closer to inducing cancer to average consumers than reducing emissions? And the best part is that this isn't just being done by transportation companies. The LAX airport in Los Angeles just took delivery of their first Nikola tray, which is their first heavy duty electric truck. It's either Nikola doing a really good job at marketing the value proposition of the vehicle, or it's all about the insane sustainability targets companies are starting to set, which in my opinion is foreshadowing what we can expect to see to happen in the US by 2030. Out of the almost seven dozen vehicles on order in LAX's electrification fleet, Nikola actually happens to be the first company to deliver their actual vehicle. This, in my opinion, really sets into perspective the first mover advantage that companies have, especially the ones that are proactive with working with connected dealer networks and incentive programs instead of focusing on a very difficult direct to consumer play. Nikola is undoubtedly the only company that is right now working with actual dealers to sell a purpose built electrified vehicle along with a charging solution that can allow companies to offset insane charging investments in the short term. Believe it or not, Nikola's mobile charging trailer actually makes a lot of sense. It's not really a marketing stunt because it allows companies to offset insane permitting and landscaping requirements to build an EV charging portal. It's obviously extremely difficult for companies to even get the cash to buy a 100 or 200 kilowatt charging system, which obviously is critical for a battery technology that takes north of two to three hours to charge on a traditional 75 system. And because of this end-to-end -end solution package that Nikola provides, Nikola has become the forefront of commercial electric adoption in most organizations. As a matter of fact, the Nikola tray can be seen here at the port of Long Beach in a promotional video of the state's very first free public charger. And I don't know about you, but I would definitely consider this more of a success than a struggle. And unlike most of these vehicles from Freightliner, Kenworth, and Peterbilt, the Nikola Tray is a purpose-built platform, meaning they can squeeze out more efficiency and it can allow them to develop the longer range hydrogen fuel cell version in 2023. That commonality in the platform actually allows the company to scale easier and also make sure there's more manufacturing efficiencies on the production line. And I think that's a very important advantage that a company like Nikola has in this space, which again, for me, is not really counted as a struggling product. The tray is actually in the hands of dealers and customers, unlike most of these other Class A trucks, which are currently in testing, prototyping, and trial stages, which obviously Nikola has already surpassed. And when you start to realize that California is going to be banning around 70,000 vehicles this week because of a standard they introduced in 2008, you start to realize how quickly the EV truck market can grow and which companies that are executing at a high level today will benefit in that shift. But obviously, I'm sure the question you guys are now asking is, apart from just having a good product and having it out on the market ahead of most competitors, how can Nikola control its costs from a business standpoint? As you can see in the latest quarter, they raked in around $24 million of revenue, but their cost of revenue was almost a double that, meaning their gross profit was in the negative at around $30 million. Now, to me, this is not really a surprise because they're only producing like 100 trucks 
a quarter. That's extremely low volume production comparing to the 250,000 trucks that are sold in the US every single year. It's no surprise that operating expenses are also in the negative and net income is also in the negative with an EPS of around negative 50 cents. And as you can see, this results in a quarterly cash burn of around $125 million on average in a quarter when they're not necessarily raising money. And if you take the current cash position of around $403 million and potentially even add the total current assets, you can get a good estimate of the quarterly cash runaway that the company has of around 3.8 quarters. But believe it or not, most companies on the NASDAQ actually trade with a similar cash runaway. The timeline of how much cash you have left is not indicative of what the business can do because there's obviously something called raising money and reducing costs, which is exactly what 2023 is going to be about. As you can see, despite the stock market being down from its latest peak and the stock itself for Nikola being at all time lows, the company was able to raise cash by selling up to $125 million in its senior convertible note. Now, this is essentially debt that's added onto the balance sheet, so it doesn't necessarily help the company in the long term, but it is the right way to approach fundraising for the short term to avoid a liquidity crunch. Now, the really unfortunate thing here is that if this recessionary phase of the market continues into 23 and interest rates are raw and interest rates are risen again like two to three percent then the chances of Nikola surviving are going to be pretty low in that case there's a lot of options the company could follow it could be a chapter 11 restructuring which is a bankruptcy or the company could get bought out in an all stock transaction by Iveco and cnh industrial in all those cases the valuation of the company will be a lot higher than it is right now on the open market but overall, that would kind of be the next path the company could follow. And for those of you that are asking what exactly is a liquidity crunch, it is essentially when the company has more debt in the 12 months from the current quarter than they have cash for those 12 months. As of right now, Nikola does not have a liquidity crisis because they have total current assets of around 486 and total current liabilities of 277. And no, these concepts don't just apply to Nikola, they can apply to any company in the stock market. And I really recommend that you guys follow a similar structure of analyzing the income, balance sheet, and cash flow statements for a company. This current stock market environment is not going to last forever, and chances are that businesses are going to come out stronger than they had going into this recession. But overall, it's still a really interesting time to be an investor and a follower of the overall decarbonization race, which is exactly why I hope you enjoyed watching this video. And since this was obviously just my opinion, let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below.